Good morning, happy Easter, and welcome to the sunrise service here at First Presbyterian Church of Moorestown. I invite you to find your worship guide. The copy can be found on the front page of our website under the bulletin link. And friends, will you join me as we offer our praises, our songs of joy, our hearts full of praise to our God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives today. Please join me in the Easter greeting, ancient words that Christians and disciples have been sharing with each other since the very first day. Please join me. Alleluia, Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. This is the good news. The grave is empty, Jesus is alive forevermore. He is risen, risen indeed, indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot put it out. He is, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is our peace, our indescribable peace. We now share with one another. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us worship God. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise our joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens, earth reply, Alleluia. So we now where Christ hath led, Alleluia. Following our exalted head, Alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise, Ours the cross, the grave, the skies, Alleluia. Friends, let's pray together. O oh, holy God, our risen God, we pray a prayer to you from Psalm 145, lifting your name up on this beautiful day. O God, I lift you high in praise, O my King, and I'll bless your name into eternity. I'll bless you every day and keep it up from now to eternity. You are magnificent and can never be praised enough. Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells stories of your mighty acts. Your beauty and splendor have everyone talking. I compose songs because of your wonders. You are all mercy and grace, not quick to anger and so rich in love. You are good to one and all. Everything you do is infused with grace. Creation and creatures applaud you, God. Your holy people bless you today. They talk about the glories of your rule, your resurrection. They exclaim over your splendor, letting the world know of your power for good, the lavish splendor of your kingdom. Yes, God, your kingdom is a kingdom eternal. You never get voted out of office. You always do what you say, and you are gracious in everything you do. Everything you do is right. The trademark of all your works is love. Let every living thing bless you, O oh God. O oh Jesus, bless your holy name from now to eternity. Jesus, this is exactly what we do today. We bless your risen name. Just so thankful for the ways in which we have received life here now and also eternal life through your incredible sacrifice on the cross. 
Oh God, we pray these praises to you this morning. And we do so praying as you taught us to boldly pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, my friends, I want to make a full disclosure to you. I'm not standing in our cemetery at 6.30 on Easter Sunday. I'm actually standing in our cemetery around 12.30 in the afternoon on Good Friday. Why? Well, because we're live streaming all of our worship services on Easter Sunday, and this is a service we just had to record a little bit earlier. And this is just one more example of an Easter like none other. In 30 years of ministry, I've never had an Easter like this one. For the last month, we've been live streaming our services on Sunday mornings, which is weird. No people in the church. On Easter Sunday, there won't be anybody here. It's so strange. It's strange to sit in our sanctuary five minutes before the start of a live stream worship service and to be in the sanctuary in total silence. All I hear are the birds chirping and the rush of cars driving by. Earlier this week, I was doing food shopping for my family, and the clerk said to uh, someone, a customer in front of me as she checked out, have a happy holiday. And I'm telling you the truth, I had to think to myself, what holiday is coming up? I, I, can't, I couldn't think of it. And then I realized, oh, Easter. Easter is coming, and indeed it is here. There's a quote that I came across from a pastor by the name of Reverend Doctor and Emily Heath. She makes a great point when she writes this about Easter in 2020. She says, the first Easter didn't happen at church. It happened outside an empty tomb in a cemetery. While all the disciples were sequestered at home, grief stricken, wondering what was going on. So we're getting pretty biblical this Easter in 2020. For those of you who are joining us who are not normally live streaming with us, I wanted to tell you what we've been thinking about in Lent. We've been reading, more than 200 of us have been reading a book by Kyle Eidelman, a Christian author and pastor. The book is called Not a Fan, Becoming a Thoroughly Committed Follower of Jesus Christ. We've been thinking about what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've learned that in the New Testament, the word Christian is used only three times, whereas the word disciple is used more than 250 times. Not once was Jesus ever recorded saying the word Christian, but he used the word disciple to name those women and men who followed him. What's the difference? Well, I think a disciple is someone who is thoroughly committed to following Jesus Christ, who wants to become like Jesus in her thinking, in the way she carries herself in life. She wants to be like Jesus in her in her attitudes. So that also means that disciples are working very hard on changing their insides, of surrendering through the process of admitting their wrongs and asking for help from others, Things like envy and bitterness, anger, rage, unforgiveness, fear. Disciples also sacrifice significantly on behalf of others, particularly the poor, those in need. Disciples also make other disciples because of the joy that they have found in following Jesus daily, picking up their cross, dying daily, following Jesus closely. They've discovered a quality of life like they have found in no other place. Lastly, disciples are those who are bound to other disciples. It is impossible for anyone to be a disciple by themselves. So disciples are in many ways much different than the way people think of Christians. Sometimes 
Christians are just so excited about going to heaven that not much else in their life is that affected by it. In fact, some Christians don't look all that much different from those who think little or not at all about Jesus. For myself, and I believe many of our members, are being drawn more and more to the idea of being disciples and becoming a disciple-making church. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. I'm going to pick up with verse 9 and read through verse 19. This is an Easter story that didn't happen on Easter. The setting of this story is one of the most beautiful in all of the Bible. It's a beach at dawn. Jesus stands on the beach with a roasting fire behind him, cooking breakfast for his friends as the dawn breaks. I want you to listen carefully to this story because it tells us something very significant about how God through Christ meets you and me today on this Easter in 2020 amid the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's also a story that tells us what it means to be disciples today from this day forward. So as I pick up the story, Peter and James and John, Thomas and Nathaniel and a couple of other unnamed disciples are now fishing on the Lake of Galilee. This is after Easter, some time, few days, few weeks later on. And they've gone fishing, not being sure what else to do. Three professional fishers decide through Peter's direction that they're going to go fishing. Fishing is what they do as professionals, but they fish all night long and they don't catch a single fish. In the morning, just as they're getting ready to call it a night, a stranger appears on the beach, calls out to them. Have you caught anything, fellas? No, their answer is. Then throw your net on the other side, which they do, and immediately their net is filled with big, fat, juicy fish. Then they figure out the stranger is Jesus. They go to shore, and I pick up the story with verse 9. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus appeared or revealed himself to the disciples. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you to where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Came across a line from friends of mine in recovery. Those who are addicts, drug addicts, alcoholics, those who are addicted to gambling or to work or to pornography, all addicts fear two things. One, they fear change. And two, they fear the way things are now. It seems to me that Americans, 
in the coronavirus pandemic are afraid of the same things. We're afraid of change because with all that has happened in just three short weeks, more than 16 million people now uh, without jobs and claiming unemployment. We have no idea what is facing us as a nation. We know that there will be more who will be infected and sadly, we know that there will be more who will die from this virus. All we can tell is that things will probably and will be difficult and hard and there is no end in sight. That's the change that we're facing and many people are just absolutely terrified by it. But then we are as afraid, sometimes now filled with dread by the thought of things continuing the way that they have for the last few weeks where we have to shelter at home. And for some of us, it feels like we're under house arrest. In this passage I just read, there are three times, beginning with verse one, through the end of the verses that I read, where John says that Jesus revealed himself or made himself known to his disciples. That word revealed to me is a very important word for us to hear on Easter Sunday. This is how Jesus comes to us today. Three things to take note of. Empty nets, charcoal fire, and the last words of the story, follow me story begins with nets of professional professional fishermen that were empty. All night long they had fished hundreds of time throwing nets into the dark waters of the Lake of Galilee and nothing came up. Nothing. Not at all. Seems to me a picture of, of emptiness within our own lives. As frustrating as and discouraging as empty nets are, our emptiness is the place where we meet Jesus. We run out of ideas, resources, and strength, and that's just the moment when he shows up with what we don't have. I've been wondering what the COVID-19 pandemic means for our nation spiritually. What's being stirred up by this change, this loss, all that's unknown? Well, like you, I'm hearing stories of high school and college students who are absolutely baffled and bewildered and afraid of what the fu this future means for them. Graduating college, looking for jobs, even going to college. I know of others who are feeling terrible loneliness, others who are depressed. A good friend of mine did a personal inventory and he thought of what he called the anchors in his life, things that were keeping him moored. And he realized that these anchors are being upturned by the coronavirus. He named some of them. My belief that our strong economy is unstoppable. My wealth is sufficient to provide security in the future. That I am healthy and will remain so. Or if not, our medical system can fix it. That my business will never fail. That my friends will be with me and they will be okay. And that God's plan for my life is one that I'll always be happily happy to welcome. That whatever we are going through will get back better again and things will go back to normal. My friend, in looking at these and other anchors, realized apparently those anchors were not as secure as I thought. So standing on the beach, Jesus says to his friends, fellows, have you caught anything? No, they said with a lot of exhaustion and grumpiness. Good news, empty nets are nets that Jesus fills. Empty lives are lives that Jesus fills. They are the only one that he fills. It was a voice, it was a command, it was the way he stood. It suddenly made the pieces all come together and the men in the boat realized that it was the Lord Jesus who was dead, now alive, standing on the beach, inviting them. They, Peter swam the hundred yards, the rest got in their boat, they, they rode in and they found on the beach a charcoal fire roasting fish and freshly made bread. I'd like you to see that picture if you can. It is one that is absolutely beautiful. There they are in the sandy beaches on a beautiful late spring morning 
And there Jesus has a charcoal fire making breakfast for them. How does Jesus greet those, Peter, who denied him three times, the rest who would just run away? You might predict that he would greet them with anger, resentment, a wagging figure, I told you so, I'm so disappointed in you. Not Jesus. He makes breakfast for his friends. The charcoal fire is also significant that John mentions it's here because a few chapters earlier, in chapter 18, John notes that Peter denied Jesus three times by a charcoal fire. This charcoal fire is a fire that depicts the great welcome and love and embrace of Jesus. Martin Luther said that God's love is like a burning fire in your hearth on a cold winter's night. Here's John's definition of God's love. God's love is like a beach fire roasting breakfast for you. The last part of this story involves Jesus taking a walk on the beach after breakfast with Peter, where three times he asked Peter, do you love me? You might think, man, Jesus, you're being really tough on Peter. Let me assure you. Peter was way harder on himself than Jesus ever was. Jesus is not looking to embarrass or to shame Peter, but to reestablish him. And so the questions come. And in truth, Peter really can't rise to Jesus' question. He says to him over and over again, you know, Lord, you know that I love you. And to Jesus, he says, yep, that's okay. Peter, you can follow me. My friends, Easter tells us today that failure is never final. Following Jesus Christ is something that I've come to believe is impossible for me. And I think those who have taken a long look at it find it impossible too. As attractive as it may be, it's something that I realize is greater than I can do. Truth is, I will fail Jesus probably every day. But his invitation to me is the same. If you question, if you waver, if you have fallen down, you can follow me again. And that following may mean following him in to things that are difficult and dangerous. That's what Jesus predicts for Peter. You'll go where you don't want to go. You'll stretch out your hands and someone else will take them. Wording that meant one thing. Peter would die on a cross, which he did. But the greater invitation came to Peter, to me, to you. Be a disciple. Follow me. Amen. Friends, we're so glad that you joined us today. We have two more opportunities to worship together today. There's a contemporary worship service that will be streamed live from Miller Commons at 930 and also traditional service live streamed from the sanctuary at 11 with special music. I want to say thank you to so many people who have given so much to the blessing box. It has been incredible to see cans of tomato sauce and spaghetti sauce and, and dry goods just piled up inside the foyer of the commons. But we still need more food, so please, if you are able, drop those off by the glass windows. Especially kid-friendly foods would be really appreciated. Friends, this week, our way of the week is number 16, give cheerfully. It says, rejoice, you get to give. Think of giving as a privilege rather than an obligation, a joy instead of a burden. As you consider all that's been entrusted to you, your time, abilities, and money, even during this global pandemic, ask, how is God calling me to share what I've been given? How is God calling you to open your hands and your heart? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, you must, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And I wanted to thank you for the ways in which you have generously given 
over this past Lenten season. It has been such a gift to see, especially during COVID-19. And so I asked Linda Jagiella, our missions director, for a few stories of how your generosity has impacted our local and global mission partners. And here's what she had to say. Here's three brief stories. In Uganda, our mission partner, our missionary Kenneth, he has opened the Yamba campus to the community there so they can get clean water from his well. Our church last year paid to have that very well dug for this community. Kenneth is also putting together meals for distribution and delivering them door to door. And the government has homes in lockdown now in Uganda, so those who venture out are being beaten by the police. But Kenneth has gotten permission from them to make these deliveries because they know he is giving cheerfully and wisely. In Haiti at Haiti Outreach Ministries, our students send us this message. Dear sponsors, family, and friends at First Presbyterian Church, we are the students of Haiti Outreach Ministries, and because of you, we are able to have jobs, a hot meal with Rise Against Hunger, and with your continued support, we are receiving an education. We love you, and we're praying for you, and we send you kisses. Corinne, who is our director of Young Life locally, said that kids are able to meet via Zoom meetings, and they're also doing youth group on Instagram Live where they're finding that God is in the midst of this bewildering time. Corinne says, we're doing youth group together and grieving the fact that we can't be face to face, but kids are tuning in with their families to hear about Jesus. It's sad to be apart, but it's also beautiful because we're praying for the day when our kids turn into adults and look back at the strange time where God taught them about depending on Him. So we're reveling in stories of hope and redemption because they are happening every day in the lives of our sweet high school friends. So friends, I encourage you to give cheerfully and ask God how you might be able to do that because you are directly impacting lives around the world and lives right here in Morristown. song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm from the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Friends, please turn to your bulletin and join me in our affirmation of faith today on Easter. This is the good news that we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day. He appeared first to the women, then to Peter, then to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We, we believe, believe Jesus, Jesus is the Christ, Christ the anointed the one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the cross, reconciles all things to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. Now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord's face shine with joy because of you. And may the Lord look deeply into your eyes and grant you peace. And may that peace which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds at rest in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Christ the Lord is risen. Alleluia. Amen. The Lord bless you.